Hello, friends. With today's magnificent story, I want to celebrate my promotion at work and also the milestone of 5,000 subscribers on the channel. I love each and every one of you and thank you for being my support. From today's story, you will feel peace and joy for the main character. Only positive emotions. Let's begin. Georgia Plummer walked into the lobby of the four-story building, across the marble tile floors, past the polished limestone walls, and to the stainless steel doors to the elevators. She didn't bother to stop at the information desk, she had instructions that told her that the office of Smith, Brown and Wilmot, Attorneys at Law, LLP, was on the fourth floor. The security guard at the information desk, hearing the click 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 of her heels as she walked across the lobby, smiled at her, although as she passed she didn't reciprocate. That didn't really bother him, he just appreciated the fine figure she cut anyway. She was a dirty blonde with light brown eyes, he estimated her height as about 5'4", with shapely legs showing beneath the bottom of her skirt, enhanced by the heels of her shoes. The heels also lifted her derriere, tightening it, which, along with the underlying pantyhose, gave her one of those almost perfectly heart-shaped asses. Damn, he liked a tight ass. She was well endowed in the breast department as well, but the guard was cognizant that women have long known magnificent and deceitful ways for adjusting their apparent breasts' eyes to their needs of the moment. He thought that she was between a 34 and 36, residing in perhaps a C-cup. Her age, he guessed was mid-30s. She was, in fact 42 years old. It took all of 30 seconds, from the time that she entered the foyer until she disappeared into the elevator. When the elevator had delivered her to her destination, she exited and found herself facing the SBNW lobby. SBNW rented the entire floor, so there was no way to be lost, Georgia could only go one place, straight forward. She passed through the glass doors with the SBNW logo embossed on it, treading on a sumptuous gray carpet, plush by commercial standards, she walked up to the reception desk. The light blue colored walls were no doubt intended to warm the atmosphere. May I help you? asked a young woman sitting behind the desk, looking up at Georgia through her fashionably small ovoid-shaped glasses. Please. I am looking for, Georgia looked at the piece of paper in her hand, Anne Wilmot. I have an appointment. The receptionist flashed her professional smile at Georgia, who might, after all, be an important client, and then picked up her phone, dialing a few numbers and quietly speaking into the mouthpiece. Ms. Wilmot will be here in just a minute. May I get you some coffee, or tea? Or perhaps, you might prefer some water we have bottles, the receptionist giggled, they even have our name and logo on them, as she pointed to a half-empty bottle on her desk. Actually Georgia, replied, a water would be great, as she sat down in one of the plush burgundy overstuffed chairs in the waiting area. The young woman handed her a bottle. We're informal here, but if you want a glass, she questioned. Georgia just shook her head, twisted off the top and took a sip. The question came from the side. It was a warm voice, soft and smooth, pitched a little on the low side for a woman. Mrs. Plummer. Georgia turned her head, searching for the source of this seductive feminine voice, to see a woman walking towards her from the side hall into the waiting area. I'm Ann Wilmot, Mrs. Plummer, she said, as she came up, her right hand extended out. Georgia stood, automatically took her hand, and found it to be a warm and firm, but completely dry grip, as they shook hands in that understated way that women introduce for the first time do. In that single moment, Georgia took an Ann Wilmot, in a single glance. People's opinion was split when they first met Ann Wilmot. Was her most striking feature the long and wavy Titian red hair, or the green eyes against her pale, but perfect complexion? Encountering her the first time, tended to result in a slightly extended pause, while they took in a first impression. That was followed by the realization that even without her high heels on, Anne Wilmot would have been at least 5'7", and that underneath the professional grey woolen skirt and jacket set, was a lean, well-contoured body. Her breasts weren't as large as George's, but they weren't small either, and she still looked like the swimmer that she had been through her university years, the upper body strength transparent through her coat. An aquiline nose, with high cheekbones, over a surprisingly full and sensual mouth, with lips that needed no enhancement, the second impression of Anne Wilmot was of a passionate woman. Georgia hated Anne Wilmot on sight, and her lips, thin and at that moment rather bloodless, tightened. I want to immediately came from Georgia's mouth. Please, Anne smiled as she interrupted Georgia's immediate outburst, come into my office and we can talk there. Georgia followed in Anne's footsteps, her demands placed on hold. Georgia found herself sitting in a red leather upholstered chair, across the desk from Anne Wilmot. 
The lawyer had asked if she could allow her a minute while she spoke with her secretary, giving instructions not to be disturbed, as well as a few other directions. Anne left the room. Georgia heard her with half an ear, while looking at the degrees and pictures hanging on the wall. If Georgia's math was correct, hardly ever a certain thing, Anne Wilmot would be about 36 years old, based on the undergraduate degree in its frame. Her law degree was dated several years after her undergraduate diploma, but Georgia really had no idea what the combination of Columbia and Michigan law implied. Georgia had attended the state university for a couple of years, but found it unedifying, when not plainly confusing. The best she could say for it was, she met her husband there. Georgia speculated about the photographs. One of an older couple, probably parents, given the man's red hair, and a woman's facial resemblance to Anne Wilmot. Graduation photos. Photos in front of the building with several older men in suits, presumably other lawyers in the firm. Finally, there were a number of pictures of the young boy, about 10 or 12 years old. A recent school photo, a portrait of the boy with Anne Wilmot, and a photo of the boy playing soccer, taken at the moment his foot connected with the ball. The most interesting to Georgia was the lack of any pictures of Anne Wilmot with a man who looked like a lover or husband. Anne re-entered the room. Pardon me, but now we should be able to talk without a constant stream of interruptions, Anne smiled as she sat down across the desk from Georgia. By the way, thank you for coming in, I know it was on short notice. I don't understand what is going on, Georgia stated, quite firmly, even petulantly. I don't understand why I am here talking to you, and I want to know where my husband is. Where is Dawn? Do you know where Dawn is? That is what your email implied. Her eyes glared across the desk. Anne didn't seem to notice Georgia's attitude, and instead shuffled around some papers on her desk, as if she were looking for one paper in particular. Then she found it, looked at it and seemed somehow satisfied. I know in general terms, Mrs. Plummer, but no, I don't know specifically where he is at the moment. I do know how to contact him, Anne concluded, looking the entire time into Georgia's eyes. Then contact him, came Georgia's peremptory command, as she suddenly sat more upright in her chair, in an attempt to display her displeasure. It's not quite so simple, Anne explained, I need to ask you a few questions first. Your husband suggested that I should try and clarify what has been occurring in your relationship, before he re-establishes contact. Anne's voice had remained calm and even soothing the entire time that she spoke, but somehow to Georgia, there was something not right. She didn't bother to respond. Good. Now, as I understand it, Mrs. Plummer, you moved out of the house that you shared with Donald for the past 10 years, along with your younger daughter Anne glanced down at the page in her hand, L, about a year ago. Your older daughter, she looked again, as if to refresh her memory, Samantha, who would have been a sophomore in college, was living on campus, and consequently didn't accompany you. Is that all correct? Yes. Donald and I had been having some marital disagreements, and I thought that a period of separation would be good for both of us to cool off and clear our heads, Georgia smiled as she responded, so I moved into an apartment not far from my where my parents live about 50 miles from here, in Greensville. Anne nodded as if in agreement, although it was just acknowledging that she understood what Georgia had said. She went on to her next question. And, as I understand it this was not a legal separation, Don paid for your apartment, continued to pay for your car and insurance, you and your daughter remained on his medical insurance, and, he also paid you an amount of money for Elle's expenses. Anne looked very serious as she asked these questions, after all, not every husband would be so scrupulous looking after a wife's well-being, who wasn't living with him. That's all true, but I continued to work as well. I'm employed by an insurance company, and I was able to transfer to our Greensville office, Georgia admitted, and it wasn't like Don couldn't afford it. You know, he owns his business, and makes oodles of money. Georgia unconsciously glanced down at the designer dress, the Gucci handbag, and Prado shoes she was wearing, evidence of both Donald's ability to make money, as well as his largesse towards his wife, and her rather expensive habits of dress. Anne looked at Georgia with the appraising eye of a woman who knows just how much the outfit and accessories would cost. Not that Anne's apparel had carried a lesser price tag, but she had earned every penny of it herself. I'll take your word for it, Anne replied, after a short hesitation, and, correct me if I'm wrong, but you moved back here and into your home with Donald some four months ago. Yes. After some discussion, I decided that we'd been apart long enough, and we came to an agreement with respect to our marriage with which I felt comfortable, 
Georgia answered the question easily enough, but to someone with Anne's training, her body language was crying out that she was concealing something, as Georgia crossed her arms and retreated back as deeply as she could into her seat. Anne continued. During the roughly eight months, she caught Georgia's eyes to confirm the time period that you were living in Greensville, Donald Soil, her eyes sought the paper again, three times. At this, Georgia was visibly fidgeting in the chair, uncomfortable about where the discussion was leading. Not surprisingly, her voice took on a defensive tone when she answered. It was very difficult to arrange things. Donald is always so busy, and my schedule and his often conflict. And Elle had become a very active girls' school, sports, and boys, of course, George's chin raised slightly, and that go ahead, give it your best shot pose, so I suppose that he didn't see Elle as much as he would have liked. But that's hardly my fault. The tone in George's voice was provocative, and she was visibly irritated. Anne let Georgia have a moment to collect herself, just allowing a brief quiet pause. Let's move on, then, Anne said to Georgia's great relief. You started calling around trying to find Donald three days ago. The question Anne asked seemed so innocuous that Georgia answered without really thinking. Yes. Donald had driven our daughters back to school, they're both attending the same university now, and the drive takes about a day each way. They had one of those rental trailers that Don was towing with his SUV. The girls will be living together in an apartment at school this year, so Don was going to help them move in and stay for a couple days to make sure that everything was working out for them you know, in case there were any problems that he could fix before he came back. Then, he was supposed to return. But he didn't. Return, that is. She took a deep breath after the explanation. Anne looked at Georgia with a somewhat skeptical look on her face. Wasn't he supposed to be back over a week ago? She queried. Um, I guess, came George's noncommittal reply. You didn't notice that he was at least four days overdue. This time Anne asked with complete incredulity, her eyebrows raised in disbelief. You didn't notice that his side of the bed was empty at nights. At this Anne actually chuckled while shaking her head. Georgia pounced on that. We have separate rooms and busy schedules. Not that it's any of your business. Georgia almost hissed at the Sirksome woman. This time she pressed on. I think it's time that you tell me where I can find my husband. Georgia spat out, her eyes growing narrow, leaning forward in an aggressive stance. But Anne didn't give any appearance of having heard her. She was holding a photograph that she had taken off the wall. A red-haired boy with incredible joy on his face, kicking a soccer ball. Parker, she said, as if that was an explanation. My son Parker. He's 12 now. I've been divorced from his father since he was two years old, Anne's words came from her mouth, but her eyes were staring into space, back in time. His father, Ted, was an alcoholic. A brilliant man in many ways, but a horrible man when he was drunk. She paused and took a breath, the couple of times that he hit me, I took it. I made excuses for it. It was really my fault, I would say. I tried to get him to change, tried to get him to stop. Suddenly her eyes were very focused on Georgia, almost making her shiver, but the night that drunken bastard accidentally broke my baby's arm, my two-year-old baby's arm, was when I realized that you can't change someone, make them better, force them to behave the way they should. There comes that time when you have to bite the bullet and cut the ties. I filed for divorce the next day, and since that time, I've never seen him again. After we've been divorced for about six months, I never heard from him again, either, she concluded. But Georgia asked, a little afraid of this woman after her outburst, what does that have to do with my husband? Your husband, Donald, is Parker's soccer coach. Came the simple calm, reply. I'll bet you don't even know that he was giving his time a couple of days a week coaching a team, did you? Georgia just shook her head without saying anything. In fact, you don't know very much about your husband, because for all intents and purposes, you left him and your marriage over a year ago, didn't you? Anne's voice was becoming harsher now, and it was she leaning forward over her desk, the aggression visible in her lovely green eyes. Georgia seemed to almost shrink and wilt in the face of this verbal assault, saying nothing shaking her head. In fact, the story that you've told me today is a sanitized, self-serving version, a fairy tale, that you've concocted to portray yourself as a virtuous wife, when in fact you have been having an affair for over a year. Anne pressed her hard. You didn't move out because you and Donald had marital disagreements, did you? Does the name Brian Cushing mean anything to you? Anne demanded. He works for the same insurance company that I do, was George's almost whispered reply. 
Isn't the truth that you moved to Greensville so that you could continue to see your lover, Brian Cushing, who had been promoted to a management position at the Greensville office, and continued to hammer at Georgia? No, no, no. Georgia stammered, without conviction, tears filling her eyes. Without a let up, Anne continued, and while you were living in that apartment in Greensville, wasn't it convenient that you could send your daughter to your parents, sometimes for days at a time, so that you could entertain Brian Cushing in an apartment for which your husband was paying? Georgia was whimpering slightly, and shaking her head, but not answering. And all the while, Donald was calling you each week trying to set up times when he could come and see his daughter. But you would disappear with her shopping, going to a movie, anything to keep him from seeing her. Worse, telling her that her father didn't care about her, that he didn't want to be bothered with her, Anne's face filled with contempt, as she spoke. But she didn't tell you about the cell phone that he gave her after the second time he saw her, did she? You never knew that she was actually able to speak with her father when she wanted, did you? Did you wonder why neither of your girls said goodbye to you when they left for college this year? Or did you even notice? It was a pounding indictment that Anne was laying on Georgia. Then, four months ago, you suddenly decide to return with Elle. Did you think no one would understand the connection between your lover being moved back here by your company, and your sudden urge to return from Greensville? Anne was almost laughing as she spoke, the best part your demand to Donald that you would return, but only on the condition that you would have an open marriage, meaning you would continue to see your lover. Because you know Donald too well, and know that he wouldn't cheat on you, despite your behavior, as long as you were married. Georgia, though, was ready to fight back. You can't prove any of that, she exclaimed, but her protestations didn't matter to Anne, she just continued. I don't suppose that you have even noticed that you haven't had what we in the legal profession call conjugal relations with Donald for over a year, have you? Did you ever notice that Donald stopped asking for or expecting sex from you from the time that you started your affair with Brian Cushing? That it was within days of when you initiated your sordid little liaison that Donald moved out of your bed and into the guest room? That he put a lock on the door to keep you out? Or were you just too self-centered to notice? Georgia had tears streaming down her face when she started to argue back. It is true that I haven't been paying attention to Donald like I should, but that's about to change. He's going to have more sex than he has ever she stopped in the middle of her sentence, as a sudden epiphany shattered her complacency. She stared hard at the woman across the table from her, younger, beautiful, no stunningly gorgeous woman sitting there, her face flushed with emotion and passion. She wasn't some neutral party, she was a player in the game, fighting to win Donald for herself. You're in love with Donald, aren't you? The question reflecting the horror in her eyes, you're having an affair with my husband. Suddenly Georgia started to assert a new confidence. You won't get away with this. Donald is my husband, and he's going to remain my husband. Her face visibly hardened, her eyes became slits, her lips two horizontal lines. At that instant, Anne slid a document, stapled together, across the table, the print facing Georgia, in order that she could read the large petition for the dissolution of marriage, written at the top of the front page. I don't think so. You have been served. Came Anne's quiet reply, Don is biting the bullet, cutting the ties, just like I did ten years ago. She sat back in her chair. There was a pause. I met Don shortly after you had moved out. He was coaching my son Parker's soccer team. He seemed like such a great guy, but there was also this deep sadness about him when he wasn't working with the boys. He just loves coaching those kids, Anne explained, looking into space again. One Saturday, after a game, the whole team went out for pizza afterwards, and eventually Don and I were the only adults left, and we started talking. I told him my horror story about my divorce, and he told me about you and your affair. He couldn't help it, he cried. I think that I may have first fallen for him right then, a man who could love so deeply, be so hurt, and still struggle on each day. Even finding a place in his heart to be there for other people's children, her face had a sudden pensive look. But then, Anne returned to the matter at hand. Her hand reached to the papers, and pointed out the stated cause. Irreconcilable differences. Donald, she said, is citing irreconcilable differences, rather than adultery, as the cause. He is offering you a very generous settlement, more than I would have recommended, given the circumstances. Obviously, child custody isn't an issue, since both of your daughters are now legal adults. That's why Donald waited until now to file. He won't get off this easy declared a now outraged Georgia. He can't prove a thing, and I'll counter suit based on your affair. If he wants this divorce, I'll take him to the cleaners. And as for you, 
I suspect that your relationship with Donald will raise some eyebrows when you try to explain how you can represent someone with whom you are having an ongoing love affair. Georgia had a triumphant look in her eyes as she struck back at this arrogant woman. Hearing that, Anne laughed. I'm not Donald's attorney. My practice is entirely corporate law. Donald just asked me if I would care to be the one who served you with your divorce papers, was her reply, the glint in her eyes mocking the soon-to-be ex-wife across the desk. When you get back home, you'll find the door to Donald's room will be unlocked, and it will be empty of his personal effects, the look of triumph now on Anne's face. And just for your information, yes I love Donald deeply, but we've never had sex together. Not because of me I've been willing, no, more I've wanted him for some time, but because Donald is too honorable and honest to betray his vows, regardless of how you've treated them, he refuses to make love to me until you're at least legally separated, she stated as she sat back in her chair, looking exhausted from her efforts. You just tell Donald, it isn't going to be that easy, was George's reply through clenched teeth. Anne once again displayed that beguiling and enigmatic smile, as she reached into a drawer and began gently tossing photographs across her desk for George's edification. There were pictures of Georgia and Brian Cushing locked together in various sexual positions and acts. Georgia was horrified and shocked they were from inside the apartment in Greensville. No court will allow these, she sneered, this is a massive invasion of privacy. I may have all of you arrested. She had moved forward in her chair again, her elbows on Anne's desk, looking like she would enjoy nothing more than reaching across and choking the life from her rival. Ah, uh, Anne answered softly, did you think that Don would pay for your apartment, your little private love nest for you and your lover, out of the goodness of his heart? Have you always thought that he was stupid? Anne was truly curious about that, because to her mind, trained in legal logic, there wasn't really another answer. That was Don's apartment. He paid for it, remember? That was his name on the lease. He had a key. He had every right to have monitoring equipment installed. No, you're wrong, these pictures are entirely legal, and if you try to fight the divorce, they will be used in the proceedings, and wasn't even gloating anymore, as she explained the reality of the situation to Georgia. Georgia had sat back in the chair and was clearly focused inward, not seeing through her open eyes, when Anne spoke again. I do have a question for you. There are an awful lot of photos and hours of videos of you and Brian. Was it all as boring as it looked? Did you really give up Donald and your marriage for that? Anne just shook her head. She found it incomprehensible. Georgia was locked in her own thoughts and didn't even hear Anne's last question. She was at a loss regarding what she should do now. Brian had dumped her the week before, claiming his wife had put her foot down. So much for his promises that he would leave his wife. At some level, Georgia knew that the real reason for his callous and cavalier attitude was that he had seduced one of the younger women at the office. She even thought that she knew who, the bitch who was dressing up a bit these days, and who seemed to look at her with contempt as she passed. What Georgia didn't know about were the photos that Brian's wife had received from an anonymous source. Don wouldn't have approved sending the photos, but Anne thought that it added a certain symmetry to the situation. In truth, Georgia had never considered that she wouldn't be able to return to Donald and restore her marriage. But that vanity had just been swept from her imagination. What would she do now? The voice in her head had no answer. Slowly Georgia lifted herself from the chair and began to walk towards the door. Anne silently rose as well and retrieving the documents from her desk, handed them to Georgia before she left. Oh, by the way, Anne stopped to say, Donald is at one of the soccer fields around town with the team. The boys are playing for the championship of their division today. But I still don't think he wants to talk you. Days Georgia didn't remember leaving the building, but the security guard was shocked. He could hardly believe that the woman who could barely walk out of the building was the same fox who had entered less than an hour earlier. She appeared to have shrunk, to have collapsed inside herself. Where there had been drive, there was now despair, the confidence was now humbled. She was a different woman, and her expensive clothes, her tastefully applied makeup, nothing could hide the change. Driving home in her black Mercedes was one of Anne's pleasures in life. It fit in with the expectation of what a high-powered attorney should drive, but more important to her was the feeling of control that she had as she would speed down the road. That need to feel in control was one of the gifts from her ex-husband, that and the two dental implants where he knocked out two teeth. They looked completely natural, the color matched her other teeth perfectly, which they damn well should add almost $2,000 a piece. Way better than a bridge. But today, her mind was on other things as she returned to her home. 
Another result of her disastrous marriage was that she didn't trust men. For 10 years, well, 9 years, anyway, Anne had been completely uninterested, despite the many men who made it clear that they would be available if she were in the game. That was until she met Donald Plummer. She had indeed met Donald when he was coaching her son's soccer team. He was a little older than she would have normally considered eligible, at least for her. At 43, he was 7 years older than she. He was handsome, and still physically fit, and one of the things that Anne noticed while watching her son's practices and games, was that there was never a woman waiting for him when he finished coaching. Never. Not even when the teams would go out for lunch or dinner after games, when most of the coaches' wives would show up at least part of the time. He wore a simple wedding band, but that might be camouflage. It was also an anomaly that he didn't himself have a son playing. With other men, the combination of no wife around and no son playing might have raised other questions. But, as soon as she inquired of some of the other soccer moms, she heard the short version of his story. Married, but with wife living in Greensville. The separation, job related, at least it was the story. What impressed her most about Don was his character. He was kind and generous to the boys, even those whose skills were not completely up to par with their contemporaries. He was unfailingly polite to everyone, even the refs. And to Anne's complete surprise and admiration, he never hit on her, something that she was accustomed to from almost every man, 15-year-old Romeos to 75-year-old Lotharios. He treated her in a friendly manner, as an intelligent person, but without the pressure of any sexual innuendo or expectations. That was before their mutual confessions after the pizza dinner. As she trembled recounting her tale of woe from her first marriage, Don covered her hand with his, gently patting it, just a simple gesture of comfort. When Anne got Don to reveal his more recent wounds, he began to quietly weep, trying to resist, but unable to hold back, Anne moved to his side of the table, and put her arms around him and held him, until his grief had passed. It was her fault, if fault it was. That night as they returned to their cars, she pulled him to her, and they kissed. Nothing between them had been the same since. It still hadn't been easy for her to trust, even Don. With the resources at her disposal due to her law practice, she had a background check done on him, just to be sure that he was telling her the truth, and that he wasn't some sort of parasite wanting to be supported by a hiring wife. To her great surprise, the report revealed that she didn't even come close to having his earnings or assets. He had a well-managed and profitable business, so money didn't seem to be his motivation. And other than his deteriorating marriage, there didn't appear to be any other skeletons in his closets. He was the real thing. She activated the garage door opener, the door rose and she pulled into her house. She gathered her purse and briefcase and entered into the kitchen. She dropped off her purse and keys on the end of the counter, in a corner where they would be convenient to retrieve in the morning as she left. She put her cell phone on the recharger at the same time. I'm home, she called out. Hey, honey, I'm in the living room, came Don's voice. Give me just a minute, Anne called back, as she entered into the master bedroom, and took her jacket off and hung it up. She returned to the living room where she found Don behind the bar. He walked out, and they embraced in a passionate kiss. Just like the very first time in the parking lot, Anne melted in Don's arms. She felt warm, protected, loved all of the things that she wanted, but hadn't gotten from her ex-husband. When they finally loosened their embrace of each other, Don reached over to the bar and handed Anne the strawberry de query that he'd been preparing for her when she entered. He grabbed his JD rocks as soon as his hand was free. He looked at her, his vision of loveliness, his Aphrodite. His face lit up and the worry lines relaxed. You are now officially separated from your wife and your divorce is in process. Anne told him, raising her glass and touching his in an ironic toast, at last. She sighed. Don wasn't overjoyed at the news, he wasn't by nature a vindictive sort of man. Although he was reconciled to the notion that divorce from his wife was the best course, he still wondered how he had failed as a man in his marriage. He took a drink and asked. How did she take it? Anne thought before she answered. As well as could be expected. I think that she somehow thought that she would just crook her finger at you, and you would come running. You would forget about the past year, forget about how she treated you. The girls she asked. I called them a couple of hours ago. They weren't terribly surprised, came his reply. Don stepped forward and hugged Anne again, but at least this time he was smiling. Well, it's time for us to get on with our lives. What did you plan for tonight? He gently inquired, while hugging his Anne. Parker is staying over at Jen's place with his buddy Mark tonight. The house is ours. 
she giggled a little. We have dinner reservations at 7 p.m. at Lascoffier, she allowed, followed by I, and at this point, Anne's hand ran across the front of Don's pants, stroking his rather evident erection, a quiet evening at home, just the two of us, making up for lost time. Don groaned slightly, good lord, Anne, be careful down there with your hand. It's been more than a year since my friend last visited a woman. I'm afraid that I'm going to disappoint you, because I'm not sure how long I can last. Anne looked at Don with a loving look in her eyes, and reached up put her arms around his neck, and kissed him again. Baby, it's been 10 years for me since the last time anything masculine has taken care of me between my legs, so you've got your work cut out for you, was Anne's response. You gynecologist. He teased. She's a woman mister. Now that you are officially free and I'm finally getting my shot at you let me put it this way, I doubt you're going to be walking in the morning. She claimed, with that look of lust in her eyes. Don't worry about getting off too quickly the first time. I'll keep you hard all night. Good thing I'm the boss then. I'll declare tomorrow a personal holiday. Was Don's wistful reply. They kissed again, before leaving for dinner. The end of the story. Isn't it such a sweet and kind story? I've read it more than once and I smile every time. I love it very much. And what do you think of this story? Write in the comments.